Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is July 1st through the 7th of the Come Follow Me program associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this week we are studying Alma chapters 17 through 22. Now, before I delve in, I want to talk about Ammon today. And the reason I say that is because it takes me a minute to segue into Ammon and to segue into the verses for this week, but I promise we're going to get there, and I promise it's relevant to this week. So with that being said, in March 2024, so this past March, there was a Relief Society broadcast. And in that Relief Society broadcast, there was a quote given by J. Annette Dennis. And this is the quote that she said. She said, There is no other religious organization in the world that I know of that has so broadly given power and authority to women. Now, this particular quote caused a lot of uproar on social media. And I spent a lot of time in the days following reading a lot of the comments that were directed towards this quote. And there is one specific argument or that was implied or directly stated a lot of times that I kind of want to talk about a little bit today. Now, there are a lot of women, a lot of even faithful women who feel who have felt silenced in the church before. They know that they are given authority in their callings. But they also feel like there are lots of people above them, more often men, who have more authority over their authority and can kind of wipe their authority away. And this has led to feelings of being passed over or ignored. And I do not disbelieve that this happens. I know faithful women who have told me stories about experiences that they've had where they felt like their voices were silenced and their perspectives were unimportant and invalidated when they were trying to contribute within their jurisdiction, within their priesthood authority, the priesthood authority that they have been given. Now, just to be very clear, I believe in priesthood authority, and I believe that priesthood authority has been given to men and women in their various callings to help build the kingdom of God on the earth. I believe that Heavenly Father leads this church and that He does make changes according to His will and that He works with us imperfect humans. I believe that the general authorities in the church are good people who are doing the best with the perspectives and experiences that they've had, and I believe that they do a really good job of it too. I believe that despite the issues caused by imperfections of people, (laughs) I believe that despite these issues that are caused by imperfection, the system that we have been given by the Lord is still effective. This priesthood authority system. I also believe that the imperfections that come along with this priesthood authority system that was given to us by the Lord, I believe that they can't actually truly take away our power, that they can't impede our personal growth. Now, there are a couple of facts that I feel like, or at least my own perspectives, I shouldn't call them facts, my own perspectives as I've tried to observe, a couple of perspectives that I feel like we can take into consideration to try and really understand what is going on so we can better understand the issues and hopefully solve problems. Now, the first one, and I ask that you listen to both of them, the first perspective is the fact that most often higher authority callings are given to men, not women. The people with the highest authorities are given to men, not women. And this leads to women feeling that at any point in time, their power and authority can be usurped by men. They can feel passed over. Now, there's two perspectives that I want to talk about in relation to this first fact, that higher authority is given to men. And it is this. I don't believe that on an individual level, if we're looking at case by case, 
basis and just looking at the individuals, I don't believe that this is actually rooted in sexism. And this is why. And this is just one example. But my husband had a calling for a while with one of his good friends. And more than once, they would plan this activity and they'd get really excited and they would prepare and they would do all this stuff and they were really excited to contribute. And at the very last minute, it would all just be taken away from them and decisions would be made over their heads. And it happened so frequently that my husband's friend actually asked to be released because he felt like, why am I even doing this? Like, you've given me this authority to make these decisions and to try and contribute, but I don't actually get to do anything. When we're looking at a case-by-case basis, I don't believe it's rooted in sexism. I believe it's rooted in a bad management problem. When you think about that verse from Joseph Smith where he talks about how as soon as anyone gets a little authority, they often tend to run away with it. They tend to abuse that power. And so I believe that the root of this problem is actually in bad management because I see it happen to women and men. Now that brings me to my second perspective that I want to talk about. Because of this priesthood authority structure, even if it's not rooted in sexism, if it's not a man saying, oh, you're a woman and I'm smarter than you, so I'm going to take away your authority. Even if it's not rooted in sexism, it does happen disproportionately to women, or we can at least make that hypothesis, because men have more opportunities to usurp power because they have more positions with higher authority. And women have positions with less authority, which means they have more opportunities to have their power, their authority usurped, authority usurped. I don't know if the Lord plans on changing anything. I know that he sees more than we see. I don't know why women are given priesthood power and that they're given authority and callings and in the temple and in their families but they're not given priesthood offices. And I've actually, I've studied that extensively. (laughs) I don't know why the Lord chose to organize it in this manner. I don't know why he chose this specific priesthood authority structure. There are lots of theories out there as to why he would choose this, but we have to be very careful when we're trying to explain something that the Lord has not explained. We may have theories, and maybe the Spirit whispered perspectives to us, but we have to remember that the Spirit whispered those to us, and we have to be careful when trying to share those with other people. We should not try and explain the Lord when He has not chosen to explain Himself. I believe that the Lord guides His church, that He makes changes, and it may take a little bit of time, but I believe that He is in control of His church and that He He guides it how He wants it to be led. I also believe that He loves His daughters as much as He loves His sons. And so how do we reconcile the imperfections with this priesthood system? Because there's imperfections because we're imperfect people. How do we reconcile these imperfections with our belief that He loves His daughters as much as He loves His sons? Two perspectives again, always two perspectives. First perspective— There are no perfect systems that Heavenly Father could have chosen to work with us because we're not perfect. We live in a fallen world. There's going to be pros and cons for every system. There's going to be chances for corruption in any system. I don't know if He plans on on changing anything. I know that He sees more than I see. The second perspective that I want to talk about comes from Ammon and the story with Ammon. And I think this is the more important perspective to talk about. And it was this story that actually inspired me to want to talk about this. So Ammon, we see Ammon and he is coming in to teach the Lamanites. And he comes into the land and he is immediately bound and taken before King Lamoni. And King Lamoni has the power to kill him if he wants or to do whatever he wants with him because he's a Nephite. And King Lamoni talks to him for a little bit, and he's like, I actually really like this Nephite. Would you like to marry my daughter? And this is how the story progresses. So this is Alma. It's chapter 17. It's verse 25.
It says, But Ammon said unto him, Nay, but I will be thy servant. Therefore Ammon became a servant to King Lamoni. And it came to pass that he was set among other servants to watch the flocks of Lamoni according to the custom of the Lamanites. So Lamoni was like, I really like you. You want to marry my daughter? And he's like, no, I'm, I, I want to be a servant. And he was placed to watch sheep. Now, if we're looking at Ammon's purpose, it doesn't really make a whole lot of logical sense, the decision that he made. If we're looking at it from just a logical perspective in this earth, it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to choose to be a servant. His purpose is to go and spread the gospel far and wide and to help the Lamanites see the error of their ways. And logically, this would almost seem easier in a position of authority as the son-in-law to the king. But he chose to be a servant. And no matter how illogical that decision might seem to be, no matter how illogical it was to choose to be a servant over the son-in-law to the king, this was the route that he chose. And it's interesting because it was exactly this choice to a choice that gave him less authority. It was exactly this choice that gave him the power to change thousands of lives. This is one of the keys here. And there could have been a couple of different reasons why Ammon chose this route. Now, I think if you were to go to some of these women who have felt silenced before, and you were to ask them, why do you want more authority? I believe that they would tell you it was because they wanted to help. They wanted to build the kingdom. They probably had experiences where they felt revelation and something that they felt like would really help, but they were prevented from choosing those actions. And it is really frustrating when you're trying to help and you feel rebuffed in doing so. And it is in these circumstances that I believe that if we were to learn what Ammon learned and to have his perspective, we would be able to do more good than we could possibly dream of. Ammon chose to be a servant. Perhaps he chose this because he knew that authority did not equate to power, or maybe it's simply because he felt a prompting from the Lord, and the Lord knew that authority does not always equate to power. The Lord doesn't care if you're a bishop. And I'm going to repeat that. The Lord doesn't care if you're a bishop, but Satan does. And that's because if Satan can convince you that you are being held back because you don't have more authority, he can distract you from the true power that Heavenly Father wants to give you. It sounds illogical, but I truly believe that in the Lord's church, you can make as much of a difference as a nursery leader, having that calling and all of the things you do in your life, you can have more influence or just as much influence as any bishop, stake president, mission president, temple president, prophet. You can build the kingdom no matter what priesthood authority or jurisdiction you have been given. You have the power to build the kingdom. And we see that directly with Ammon. Ammon was a servant who looked after sheep. His circle of influence was greatly diminished by not marrying the daughter of the king. He chose to be a servant over sheep, and that was exactly the position that he needed to be in to change thousands and thousands of lives. I am a daughter of God, and I am powerful despite whatever jurisdiction I have at any given time and any calling. If we diminish our priesthood power to only the authority that we have in formal callings, then we are greatly diminishing the power that Heavenly Father can utilize on the earth to change lives for better. You are important. God believes you're important. He believes in you. But until you believe that you have all the power you need, regardless of what calling you are currently holding, until you believe it, 
The only true limiting factor here is you, because God is ready to take you above and beyond what you imagined for yourself in making a difference and having influence and changing thousands of lives. Now let's look at a a specific circumstance. So we can look at this principle in, I guess, a real life circumstance. Let's say that you're a Relief Society president and you feel a very strong prompting about something that you want to do with the Relief Society sisters. And the bishop comes in and he overrides your decision. It is very easy to look at it and feel like you've had your power taken away from you. It's very easy to feel that way. But is that truly the reality? What are we really looking at in this situation? If we're going to be totally honest and call it how it is, maybe, maybe the bishop has an ego problem that he's still working through. It could be a management problem. Or maybe he's doing the best he can with the perspectives he's been giving and he's being led along and having his eyes open by the Lord, but it takes a little bit because guess what? It takes a little bit for all of us to have our eyes opened and our perspectives broadened. And once again, it's very easy to feel like whatever the reason is, your power has been limited, but is that really true? I believe that the Lord can move heaven and earth to help something happen if it really needs to happen. I believe that He can bring humility or clear perspective. And if nothing changes, I also believe that you still hold all the power you need to make the difference that Heavenly Father wants you to make. We learn from the scriptures that if Heavenly Father is giving you a commandment, He will give you a way to fulfill that commandment to Have the power to change the lives of those who are in your priesthood, authority, jurisdiction. Now, sometimes we equate power with authority, and there's truth to that. And being able to make decisions and have those decisions be followed through on. However, this is an extremely slim definition of power. True power, true, true, true power is a recognition of who you are, a recognition of who the Lord is and what He's capable of, and a recognition that the Lord wants to propel you so much farther than you have the vision to recognize. Sometimes we equate power with having a microphone and speaking to tons of people at the same time and and sharing a message. But is that really true? If you are looking for true power— What I believe you'll find is that wrapping your arm around someone is going to have tremendous power. Approaching someone with compassion is going to far outweigh the influences of decisions that are going to be made that are far removed from individuals. I believe that your prayers are going to have way more influence than someone who gets to speak at the fireside. I believe that The Lord can inspire you with creative solutions despite any authority that might be over yours. Look at your own life. Who has had more influence in your life? Was it a talk given by a prophet or was it an involved parent? A talk by a prophet can change a life. I believe that. Absolutely, I believe that a talk given by a prophet or any leader can change a life. But I also believe that that talk will mean nothing without the foundation that was started by an interaction with a disciple of Jesus Christ. That talk that was given by the prophet influenced me because I had a mother who taught me about the gospel and shared her testimony with me. And that's why that talk affected me. We have all the power and all the opportunity that we actually need. No matter what authority is where or who gets placed over us and whether they have management problems, 
We have all of the power and all of the opportunity we need to change lives because that's the goal. It's to bring people closer to our Heavenly Father. I believe that there are imperfections in the priesthood authority system because, I shouldn't say in the system, there are imperfections in the people that are in the priesthood authority system. And because of that, there's problems. But because of the fallen world that we live in, all of the decisions that Heavenly Father's having to make in regards to the earth are going to have problems. Agency, agency causes a lot of trauma. This priesthood authority structure, it's, there are imperfect people in it, and so it causes problems. Heavenly Father has to make decisions with his perspective of this fallen world. But there's this little thing called the atonement of Jesus Christ that can make up for any problem that can take any problem and turn it into something incredible. Because of the atonement, there's a loophole. And that's really what it is. It's a loophole. We came to earth, we sinned, but we still get to go back to our Heavenly Father. And we come to earth and there's agency and it causes trauma, but the Savior can fix that and He can heal us. And we sometimes have our authority taken away from us. But because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, nothing, we have all of the power and opportunity we need. I believe in a heavenly father and a heavenly mother who make decisions together for our benefit. That they're both deeply involved in the details of our lives and in the details of the church. I believe that they lead, guide, and love together. I believe that we have the capacity to make any difference that they want us to make. I believe that the road that they have for us is the most powerful road that we can take in our lives and that nobody can keep us away from doing the things that they would have us do. That all of the obstacles are opportunities to become more like them our opportunities to invest more faith and by investing more faith, finding more power to do more good. I believe that those things are true. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.